All right, welcome to everyone. Welcome. This is delightful. Um, I want to thank Sister Mary for extending invitations to the parish of Bless uh, Saint, not Blessed Saint Mary Ann Cope. Um, for folks who are already very involved in doing good, welcome. To our own sisters, associate staff members, nursing and the administrative staff here. Um, to all of you, thank you for coming this morning. You're a representation of what presentation people means. We at our chapter, as most of you know, um, made uh, a very important uh, decision. And that would be for the next six years, in a very special way, we would reach out to the needs of women and children, particularly as they are impacted by economic, environmental, and racial inequity. And when a few of us were brainstorming and thinking and looking at the city of Newburgh and the environs, Truthfully, for me, one of the first agencies that popped into our mind in terms of living out that commitment that we had made at our, at our chapter was Habitat for Humanity. Because right on your website, which is incredible, these words pop right out. Seeking to put God's love into action Habitat for Humanity of Greater Newburgh brings people together to build houses, community, and hope. Every morning after Mass, we say a prayer together, and it ends with, may we become women of hope, right? So with that in mind, we want to welcome our important guests. We welcome Jill Marie, the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity, and we welcome Heidi Johnson, Community Advancement Director. They have so much to share with us. But just one little aside, Sister Martha, who is our Congregational Archivist, came across a very important snapshot yesterday, and she showed it to me, ah, oh, for youth. From 2004, mm -hmm. a group of presentation sisters from Staten Island and New Windsor um, outside okay. one of the Habitat bills in 2004. We have a history with Habitat. Habitat has been dear to our hearts for many, many years, and we look forward to falling even more in love with your mission and your vision and seeing if there are ways in which we can either, even rather further collaborate. So may I hand it to you? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am, um, you know, listening to our mission statement that she read, I, I got chills, you know. Um, <laughs> I've been in my position since October and every day I wake up and I'm just feeling so blessed that uh, this is the path that has led me here. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and you can see why I'm beaming. Um, I started out in corporate finance many years ago as a single mom working, uh, you know, 40, 50, 60 hours with no education. Um, did really well, you know, I moved my way up in that corporate world, but then I hit a space in which I couldn't really advance and I couldn't really take care of my family. I was living with my parents back at home with them. Um, and made the decision to go back to college and get some credentials so I could further my economic development and, and support my family. And so I also decided at the time that I wanted to find something that would feed my soul. I didn't want to work in a little cubicle calculating numbers. And so um, my path led me to uh, AHC full time, up to SUNY New Paltz, and then I ended up getting my master's in what was called then Multicultural Humanistic Education, which is now their social justice program. Mm -hmm. uh, and there I will say, when I walked into my first class, I found home. I found people who were like-minded, I found idea sharing, I found space in which the injustices of the world that I could see, we were talking about and trying to solve for. 
And so that put me on a trajectory of working for multiple nonprofits. And as I mentioned, I've been here since October. And again, I found home. You know when you're around folks that are just like you, who think like you, who, who show up and do the mission work that's so important for what we do here in the community. So i um, always amazed, I will say, that in my six months, everywhere I go in Orange County, someone has a story about how Habitat has impacted, influenced their life, whether it was volunteering, whether they know a family, whether um, they just see what's happening in the world and, and are looking for solutions as well. So again, just so grateful for that. Most I asked earlier if you were all from the area, primarily yes, and there may be some that will be tuning in or watching this at another time from other areas. And so just a little information about Habitat. We are an international organization. And every affiliate looks different because our, our mission is to meet the needs of the community in which the affiliate is residing. And so for us here in Newburgh, we are celebrating 24 years and we've built 103 homes. Yeah. Yeah. And it's through the partnership with the city, through the partnership with the faith community. We have multiple, uh, 37, over 37 of those homes were built by the faith community and their fundraising efforts. Um, and we have just really been able to transform. If you've ever gone down East Parmenter, it's our um, showcase block, if you will, uh, where we built over 20 homes on one street and turned a street that um, folks who grew up in the city of Newburgh speak about it as being, you know, a place for drugs, a place for violence, a place that they weren't allowed to walk down, you know, on the way to school. And now it's a thriving environment. So we are very fortunate in that. All right. I won't repeat our mission because she's so very much lovely um, described that it is on our website. But what I will say is that we are a organization, an international and local, that is founded in spiritual and religious beliefs, though we are welcoming to everyone. And so many of our, almost all of our gatherings, when we have our coffee break, when we have our events out in public, we always begin with a reflection just to, again, bring that back to ourselves and to our grounding and our spirituality in the space um, and know that what we are doing is rippling effects, as we mentioned, not just for families that buy the homes, but for the communities and for the volunteers. I listen to the stories of our volunteers that come in. I listen to our founder uh, members, and it is family. And so though, you know, doing this work when you're getting dirty, when you are painting, when you are digging, when you are nailing and you're sweating and everyone is e uh, equal, you know, they always say we leave our ego at the door and we show up and we do what needs to be done. So, oh, so. we currently, and this actually needs to be updated because as of April 14th, which was when I was supposed to be here for the first presentation, and I ended up having to cancel, so I apologize. We did what was called a framing frenzy, mm -hmm. and we were able to, over two days, build the walls for four houses, interior and exterior. We had over 200 volunteers show up. I will be lying if I said I wasn't nervous the week before. <laughs> Uh, when I looked online to our signups and there was like 20 people, I'm like, oh, my God. So how are we going to do this? One thing I am quickly learning about Habitat is people show up. They show up. And I was just amazed. And it was like that really hot day. It was two hot days in April. And it was like 90 degrees. It was crazy. Um, so now we currently have 12 houses under construction. And we have 18 families in our program. We are seeing that the housing crisis of Orange County is really impacting our community. And that's evident by the amount of folks that are coming to our door asking for assistance to purchase a home. So as I mentioned, 103 homes in the city of Newburgh. We have partnered with the city of Newburgh in the past. They have had homes or property that was foreclosed upon. And we were able to purchase them from a dollar or pay the back taxes and um, be able to build within that space, right? Great partnership, if you will. Now with the housing market, those properties and the availability of them are shrinking. And it's not matching the demand 
of the families that need homes. So what's important to know is that we are Habitat of Greater Newburgh, and our service area actually encompasses the entire southeastern side of Orange County, all the way down to Goshen, Chester, Blooming Grove. We've not traditionally built there, and traditionally property values have inhibited us from doing that, um, but now we have to really just start thinking and expanding our mission and the work and be creative as to where we can meet the needs of our entire county and our entire community. There is currently a small affiliate out of Middletown that's in the process of dissolving. And they, um, you know, running a nonprofit is not easy, and especially when that's based off of volunteers. And so um, we will be acquiring a property there and placing a family as well. So we're looking outside. We're not leaving Newburgh. We love Newburgh. That's where our roots are. So we're going to continue to build in Newburgh, but we're also looking for opportunities outside of that to further our mission. So what do we do? Um, community, houses, and hope. All of those things look very different for every person, depending upon their, um, their experience, their trajectory of life, and where they've started from. So we serve families. That is at the core of what we do. Every decision that we make as an organization is based on how are we serving families to ensure that they have a decent place to live. The community comes with the volunteers that show up. And we have volunteers that do everything from baking chocolate chip cookies to serve at coffee break on Wednesdays and Saturdays, to volunteers that volunteer on our ReStore, um, which we'll get to, um, or volunteering on our construction site, or stuffing envelopes. Because for nonprofits, there's so many things that we do within an organization to keep us moving administratively to serve families that our volunteers are really our bloodline. But I will tell you that this really will, um, will wrap it up, give you a good oversight. So every October, we have our fundraiser, which is a Building Houses Building Hope Breakfast. Um, it is the most efficient fundraiser. I've been a nonprofit for a while. It's the most efficient uh, fundraiser. You're in and out in an hour. I love it, right? Like, it doesn't take any time. You show up at 8, we sell your coffee, we do our spiel, and we boogie. Um, and so we do put together a video for that presentation, and this is from last year. And I think it's such a strong education tool and information for outreach. So I want to share that with you. I grew up here in Newburgh. My mother taught me the value of owning your own home. With Habitat Newburgh's help, I'm turning my dream of home ownership into reality. Local families come to Habitat Newburgh because their biggest challenge is being able to qualify for a mortgage. Here at Habitat, the wonderful thing about us is that you don't have to um, compete, as I say, but you do have to qualify. So they say, oh my God, but I need house, I need a lot of money. It's not true. The more important thing, do you want it? Do you got it? How did that help you? Another challenge that they have is their credit history, and so many of them fall short of being able to qualify. I got three hundred dollars in the bank when Habitat said, Congratulations. And now it's my broken house. There are certain requirements that the home buyers have to meet prior to completing the program. Working on the site, working in events, 
and in our restore, as well as completing mandatory classes that are geared towards helping them become more successful homeowners. The biggest lesson I learned in classroom was how to fix credit. They gave us examples of how to write credit bureaus and get reports off your credit. We average about 20,000 hours a year of volunteer work. They come out from all different neighborhoods, all different backgrounds. We build about eight houses a year, half brick rehab and half new construction. We rip the whole innards out of the house, really just a brick shell, and then we totally reconstruct it. If we do construction, we start with a blank lot, or we might start with a old foundation that has to come down, and we build a whole new house. The houses will last for many generations for these families so that they have something to pass on. Our home buyer families have a certain amount of hours that they have to put in as part of their equity to their house. So they come out and they volunteer. I chose Habitat because I thought that Habitat would help me learn how to build things on my own. Habitat is family. I'm working in the house. I do and everything. I don't know this is my house. And everybody joking. I got a good time. I love it. They're there side by side with everybody, putting the house up putting walls up. I learned how to build a porch. I learned how to fix a roof. I learned how to build the siding. So they see it from start to finish. Hopefully then as a homeowner, they're able to know when a problem is coming and some knowledge on how to deal with that issue. We also have groups from local banks and corporations and colleges and some religious groups. People want to be there and want to do the work. We have a common thing and we all work for it. Yes, the goal was to build the house, but it's really about the family. It's really about the home, not the house. Here at Habitat, we bring families, volunteers, and people together to create not only home ownership opportunities for individuals, but to create a community and a neighborhood. What I'm looking forward to the most about owning a home is building a big family, having cookouts with my neighbors, and being great to the community. community is growing and changing, but through this change, those low to middle income families who otherwise would not have a chance to live in this community, have that opportunity and are contributing. I'm broken, I'm single mother. I got a house. I got a house and I'm happy, very, very happy. I'm looking forward to a big time. I can't wait to start fixing it up and living in it. Mm -hmm. I can't wait. Home is everything. So that last house uh, that you just saw, the Chinese in the window, is 157 North Miller. Uh, that is one of our current women build homes. Uh, and that is one of our examples of how, yes, we partner with the city, but sometimes, like all relationships, we have to take things that we might not want. Um, and so that house in particular was has been very challenging to reconstruct and redo. And so as you said in the video where, you know, we essentially gut an entire house and leave the brick walls up and then rebuild a home inside it. And we have to do that because we are in the second largest historic district in New York State. And so those are the rules that we have to comply with while building in New York.
So some misconceptions about what we do and um, someone who's really about public education and information is that people think that we give away our homes. Um, and in fact, that's not at all the case. The homeowners purchase them through a traditional institution, local banks and other lending institutions. How it works though and why they're able to afford it, they are typically low to middle income families and um, they have to put in what you saw was sweat equity. So it's part of the process is they have to put in 250 hours of work on a construction site, a portion of which in their own home. Uh, for two working adults in a home, it would be 500 hours. And so when you think about working families, working Monday through Friday, that is volunteering every Saturday for 14 months. So it's a commitment. In addition, they also need to participate in our curriculum. We have about a six month program currently that walks families through what credit is, how do you read your tax bill, um, how to change the filter in your oil tank. For many of our families, they are first time homeowners as well as the first ones in their family generation to purchase a home. So things that you don't necessarily have to deal with when you rent, you know, as a homeowner are in charge of. So we try to make sure that they're successful in that space. In addition that um, we keep our doors open. So once the home is sold to the family, we don't have any expectation that they stay connected to us. You know, this destiny of choice. Um, but we do keep our doors open and we do continue that conversation and that collaboration for families that, you know, are looking for additional supports. And we have some additional classes and things that they can attend as they go. Another is that um, currently um, there's misconception directly in the city of Newburgh that we're only working with uh, Latino or Latinx families. And um, I really like to speak on that point because um, with, with the gentrification that's happening in Newburgh, it is very important for us to have a conversation about black home ownership and the struggles and the challenges that that community faces. So we have about 50% of our applicants that come to us are Black or African-American, and 50% currently are Latino. The issue typically becomes credit. And so for generations of families who put making some assumptions, I'm you know, speaking on some uh, data and some assumptions, but um, for Black families who have lived in generation in the country, they've been um, subject to predatory credit practices, right? They get that credit card application as soon as they turn 18. And so fixing credit takes longer than 12 to 18 months. Whereas oftentimes the Latino or Latinx families that come to us, they've not been, you know, they've not been victims of that. And so they're coming to us with no credit. So it's a lot easier in 12 to 18 months to establish good credit when you basically have none than to repair um, years and years potentially of some bad credit. We are uh, working with our international affiliate and really advocating and working out curriculum for the Black community to make them successful, that even if in 12 and 18 months they're not able to qualify for our program, that we'll be working with them to, um, it's called Homeward Bound, to get them to the space in which they could qualify for our program. Um, and then, of course, I always get, did you get to meet Jimmy Carter? <laughs> um, and, you know, our, our prayers are with him and his family currently. Um, he has been one of our biggest ambassadors for Habitat. So our founding organization was from America's Georgia. And the legend is that Jimmy and his wife passed through that community where they were building an intentional community based on volunteering and building home and equity. And as he passed through and got to volunteer there, he fell in love with the concept and then became our biggest ambassador. And so we're so forever grateful for him and his family for you know, being that voice for Habitat and that nationwide. And so as much as I... Like I've only been here since October, so no, I've not been able to meet him, unfortunately. But I'm um, so very grateful, obviously, for the family and their support. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes people say, who is eligible? And um, as I mentioned, my early career was in numbers. So I love numbers. It makes sense in my head. Um, we work with families 
that make between 30 and 80% of AMI, average medium income. Now, depending upon how many dependents you have, that scale changes. But as a single mom, I love to use myself as an example, that 80% of AMI to be eligible for our program, a single working household member with two dependents who makes $60,000 or less. When you think about that, that's our town clerks, that's our um, nursing assistants, that is the majority of women that are working out in the workforce now. And so almost all of them are, would be eligible for our program. We want to make sure there's a whole process, as I mentioned, the, the, the curriculum they go through, they work with a credit counselor. And um, you know, our job is to ensure their success to make sure that long-term affordability of that mortgage happens. So in, on average, it costs Habitat for New for Newburgh about 300 to $350,000 to build a house. We in turn sell it to the family for 30% of their monthly income, which roughly equates to a mortgage of about $125,000 to $150,000. So our job is to make up the difference. That $150,000 to $300,000 to $350,000, we are able to make that up with some grants and some subsidies, mostly fundraising, oftentimes donations, from uh, suppliers out there, wood, lumber, et cetera. And it's becoming quite challenging as property values increase in our area, right? As over 40,000 people from New York City came up here during COVID, mm -hmm. um, our prices are skyrocketing, which means our property taxes are skyrocketing. And at the end of my presentation, we're gonna come back to that subject. <laughs> So the three things we ask people to do, they have to have a need for housing, they need to have the ability to pay, and they need to be a willing partner. As we said, that sweat equity and that participation of our classes. So 65% of our households are paying more than what they can afford. And that was a statistic from 2020. I'm not sure what it is now, and my guess would be a lot more. You know, if you understand the market right now, rentals in Newburgh are $2,400, $2,600 a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so people are stuck in this cycle, right, of renting and renting and renting, which means that they're probably taking out credit cards and they're probably, you know, messing up their credit, in addition to not having the ability to save money for a down payment. Mm -hmm. my information, but I'm going to talk about some of the handouts that we had, and I'm going to come back to two things. One is I mentioned earlier our ReStore. That is located on South Plank Road. That is for donations of household goods, construction material, furniture. The proceeds from that store enable us to build a house a year. So it's our largest fundraising life, right? Back to that $300,000, $350,000 number. So if you have items, if you want to donate, let us know. We have a truck that goes out twice a week and picks things up. Um, we have a lot of fun there. They had a, um, a woman who came in and she like rehabbed some furniture and did a whole class. You know, so we're trying to be more interactive. And again, I love that education, uh, that education piece there for us for the ReStore. The handouts that we're given kind of walk you through. One is um, the map of where those 103 homes have been. So it gives you an idea. We, our philosophy is block by block. It makes sense building to be building more than one project in a cluster, right? So we don't have to drive the truck there once. <laughs> um, in addition that we see what that community piece that we spoke about before really incorporates. We have a neighborhood revitalization specialist. Um, he is out in the community touching base with the homeowners, touching base with the renters, really getting um, 
you know, on the boots on the ground, what's happening in the community when it comes to housing. He also works with neighborhoods to establish neighborhood associations so that they can lobby and advocate for themselves and their needs and understand city government and all the uh, ins and outs of that, which I've had a crash course on <laughs> in six months. Um, we have um, our advocacy efforts, as I mentioned before. And so just talking a little bit about property taxes and values and um, what, you know, um, we were, I said, you know, is there any advocacy that we can do? We love writing letters. We want to be, you know, part of the change. And I said, ah, I've got something for sure. Um, so currently up in New York State, in both the Assembly House, um, there is a bill being uh, introduced called the Fair Assessment, Fair Housing Assessment Bill. Um, and I brought letters here. One is our letter that we say to our friends and our supporters, and one is a template that you can fill out and send. But going back to those numbers, if you will, that family that traditionally could purchase that home, remember that cost us three hundred dollars to $350,000 to build, they are under the old property values, because that's your taxes, um, they were able to qualify for mortgages of $120,000 to $150,000. Now that property taxes are rising, and we just built our home on 162 North Miller that appraised for $380,000. The property taxes on that house alone are $14,000 a year. Yeah. So our policy is to only sell home for 30% of the family's income. That's all taxes. So their mortgage now is dropped. And we're going to essentially sell that home for about $95,000. Because we want to ensure that the family is successful and stays within that 30%. Yes, there's star credit. Yes, there are other credits that families can apply for. But that is after the closing, after they purchase the house. And so the fair housing assessment law allows municipalities to assess the property taxes on the first mortgage. And so when I was telling you about making that up, those grants and those subsidies that we get to make up that difference, essentially those are liens that are put on those houses. The families have to live there five years, 10 years, 15 years in order for that lien that's attached to that subsidy to be released. And by the way, out of the 103 homes, only eight have sold them and six sold them back to us. I think that's pretty successful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think people are often concerned that people are getting something very cheap and are going to turn around and sell it. They don't. They don't. They're, they're, they're able to live there and afford it. But this property tax, uh, tax assessment bill allows the municipalities to assess the, home, the property taxes on the first mortgage for the life of those liens. So after those 15 years, after they've met the requirements for the subsidies, then it would go to the property tax value. And that allows Habitat Newberg to sell the home and get that cash flow back, if you will, into our operating costs to build more homes. And so if you're interested, um, we certainly have the letters there for you. We would appreciate that support. Um, I feel like I'm talking a lot. I'm very casual, as you can see. I'm more of an integrated. Are there questions? Thoughts, I'd love to hear what your perspectives are, maybe some of your concerns. I would like to. Yeah. yeah. So we run the um, outreach to St. Mary Hope. And a lot of times we do get, most of, most of it's true, but we're kind of like a conduit where a lot of people want to donate everything and anything. And um, some of it's furniture. Uh, we do have a resource right now that we, we, we call um, for they require pictures before they come in and get it. Uh, what what is your procedure on that? We get furniture in that. We would ask the same. You know, we have a list of what we take and what we don't take. Mm -hmm. um, and so yeah, typically we would ask for pictures for several reasons. One, to ensure that we know that we can sell it. Uh, back and secondly, as we're trying to play Tetris in a moving truck, we know how things kind of can fit fit in there. So yes, yeah, so we definitely can, can provide you. That is on our website. We don't take things um, that we can't test to be sure they work. For example, um, electronics, electronics TVs, things like that, you know. Um, 
and no clothing, right? right? We don't do clothing or fabric stuff. No. Um, but yeah, so we would require that as well. We have a donation coordinator. Her name is Diane. Um, we can set that up. She's you know sets up the calendar, everything. We also ask because um, we have volunteers and some staff that do that that the items are brought to a level like we don't go in the house to like pull things out and carry it downstairs. You know, liability. Um, so we ask that things are out on the curb or on the driveway for us to pick up. Yeah. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Could you say a little bit about the family, the uh, dedication of the houses, and that aspect of it is? Thank you. Important. Yes, thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned, we have a very active interfaith uh, community that works with us. Uh, just in April, there was a house blessing that happened in Downing Park to bless the properties that we newly acquired on Third Street. And so um, families come to us and they apply for the program. They, you know, as I say, go through the application, go through all the documentation, which is all on fair housing standards. We are, we have to be certified to do that legally. Um, they then go through the uh, curriculum, they start their classes and they start their sweat equity. When they've reached about 75% of their sweat equity, we do what you saw in the video that reveal, where we let them know where they're living. They don't get to pick their house. Um, which, you know, sometimes people are like, oh, no, then no thank you, right? Um, but with our inventory, we have to match up the family's needs to the homes that we're building the best that we can. When you are given a property, like 157 mm -hmm. North Miller, it's tiny. We're going to be able to, only able to put two bedrooms in that house, and so therefore we matched up with Janice, who's a single woman right now, right? So we match that up. So at 75% of their sweat equity, we reveal to them where, where they're gonna live. It has caused problems. Um, I mean, I'll be transparent. Um, we have built in some neighborhoods where families have withdrawn because of gang activity and other crime. Um, but we, we do our best to match up with, um, with the needs of the family and that they've invested all that time and energy as well into this process. We hate for them to like kind of opt out. Um, so once um, they're done, they reveal, they then, like I mentioned, have to do a percentage of their hours in their home. That's part of some of our loan requirements and our subsidy requirements. And then as we get closer to the actual closing, so now they're, they've done their classes, they've done their sweat equity, they go to the lending uh, bank of their choice, they get to pick, and um, then we get closer to the closing for that mortgage, then we do a house dedication, as you were speaking about where um, we invite their, um, their leader of their faith community to come, do a blessing of the house. We provide them, if they're willing to accept a Bible from us, we, we, we hand that out as well. And we do a ceremony in that space to not only you know, hand the keys over ceremoniously, but invite all the neighbors. Because for us, that is part of the success of home ownership is building those connections with your neighbors. Right, we are we support our families, but we can't be there at two a.m. if somebody's car alarm is going off, and they like they need to know each other, and they need to be confident in those relationships. And so, through that dedication process, we invite all the neighbors, we invite our supporters to come out and meet the family, and really um, just welcome them and engage them in that process of owning. Does Habitat have an ongoing program that they communication with the families that have moved into the homes? Yes, yes, we put out a newsletter. Our Family Service and Program Department puts out a newsletter that is full of resources for them. We have as well like email blasts. So um, part of what our Neighborhood Revitalization Specialist does and our Family Program Coordinator, they are in touch with other nonprofits. And we, have, because we are literally one block behind DSS, if you're familiar with Newburgh, um, we get a lot of people that just walk in and are looking for resources. Even if it's not something we provide, we do that soft handoff. Um, staff just three weeks ago literally got on a bus with a woman and got her up to the library to get some resources because she needed housing for that night. She was in an emergency situation. So we stay in touch with not only our homeowners providing them resources, but also a resource for the community in general to make sure that we give them that soft touch 
um, we are, our doors are always open, you know, um, and we, if we don't have the answer, we try to try to solve that as well. The houses are warrantied, so we warranty the work. So we also have a warranty program with houses. So if they have an issue with the house, they come to us, we fix, maybe a piece of siding fell off. You know, we're, our builders are volunteers. <laughs> you know, sometimes <laughs> things aren't perfect, 100%. So we warranty the work and we will go back in and we will assist with that as well. So there's a whole warranty program that comes along too. Yeah. Where's your office? No. We are at 125 Washington Street, the Kimball building there. Um, we were recipients last April of, uh, of Mackenzie Scott funds. So if you've been watching in the news, the divorce that was happening, I'm sorry, terrible what was the last one's name, John, best of the Amazon, Jeff, thank you. I remember her name because she gave us the money. Um, <laughs> and that's what matters. Uh, so she, through that divorce settlement, uh, took a larger for settlement and went to our international affiliate and said, we wanna give this to Habitat International, but we're gonna let you as the international uh, entity decide who gets it. So not every affiliate in ha for Habitat got, got those funds. We did, we received $2 million. Um, it's great, but at $350,000, that's four houses. And that's the reality. So our job is to really take that 2 million and kind of build the capacity and build the processes to ensure that we can do more than additionally four houses. As Mike said in the video, before COVID, we were building about six to eight homes a year. I have 12 under construction right now, another four slated to be done before the end of the year. Um, with 18 families, we're trying to meet mm -hmm. that need. Um, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but as far as the volunteers go, the skill set. Like I'm looking at all those things, like how do you put in windows and you know all those kind of things. Is that something? What or are those more like true people that are in that kind of business? No, it's everyone. So the our construction crew, I say, is not only great at the craft, but they are great teachers. And uh, during the framing frenzy, I really got to hear them firsthand. I don't get to be on the site a lot, um, but I got to hear them firsthand on how they are instructing folks how to do those things. There's a job for everyone. I was on a build site where um, we were ripping up the flooring and there was a gentleman there who had um, some back issues. He wanted to volunteer. So literally his job all day was as we fill the garbage can, he is the one who brought it out and brought it to the truck, right? There's a job for everyone and he will learn those skills. Tying me right into a women build week, which is happening June 6th through the 10th. And the premise behind Women Build Week is that it traditionally started to allow a space for women who traditionally were not in those spaces. They were not in construction spaces, right? <laughs> not use a handsaw or a drill, right? And times are changing, but are they? I don't know, right? So um, we have a week during the year in which we dedicate to Women Build and it's women-led teams. Men are welcome to volunteer, but we allow them to be the ones present on those spaces and those sites. And we were speaking, I'm not sure where she went, we were speaking about um, our current women build house that's finishing up on 64 Overlook, which is in the memory of Celeste Bloomer. Mm -hmm. And um, I did not have the pleasure of meeting her because I'm fairly new, but I've heard so many wonderful things about her. And uh, one of the, the stories, you know, you in 24 years, you inherit a lot of stories that come with the agency. And so one of the best stories that I've heard about Celeste is that she would tell women, if you know how to run a hand mixer, you can run a hand drill. <laughs> That's like brilliant, right? <laughs> Making a safe space in which everyone is capable. You know, um, we also currently have, have embarked in and working with volunteers um, from Inspire and Access Awards for Living. So we're working with volunteers with adults with disabilities just being inclusive to that space because it is, like they said, you leave your ego at the door and everybody has an opportunity to learn something. Is there a director of volunteers? Heidi is our director of community advancement, which includes volunteers, yes. <laughs> Fundraising, volunteers, events. She's got a, she's got a big plate over there. Uh, she's also new to our team. February? No, um, January, MLK Day, we were just talking about that. So she joined us in January. So learning the industry and learning all the ins and outs of Habitat. Mm -hmm. 
I didn't get on my money. How about if you know some Heidi Johnson? Oh, I thought you were. I'm, I'm Jill Marie. Marie. <laughs> it's okay. You said there was a little bit about the coffee break that we have for your workers mm -hmm. and what day it happens and, and what type of things you need for that. Sure. So uh, every Wednesday and Saturday, guaranteed, we have coffee break for our volunteers and our site crew that comes off. On Wednesdays, it happens in our office at 125 Washington Street. And then starting June, we will be at Calvary Church on Saturdays. And so it's a space where um, our volunteers serve coffee, cakes, whatever little notches that we can have, because they don't really get an, a, a lunch break. Our, our build time on sites is 8 a.m. to 1.30. There's not a lunch break in there, so that the coffee break is there. That's where we do the reflection, as I mentioned. We also share all agency news. We identify and welcome new volunteers. We identify and welcome new family members who are working on site. Um, I think it gives volunteers, you know, just that awesome, like, oh, I was, I was working with you all day, and you're going to have this to be your home. That's amazing. You know, and it helps you feel like you're giving back into that process. And so... Um, we have a, a, a website under Volunteer Hub, which you can find from our from our Habitat website. I think there's a little, it's on the left or the right, I think it's on the right. It's on the right, Volunteer Now. That leads you to a, a, a digital platform that tells you and shows you all the volunteer opportunities that are out there. And that's updated weekly. So you can also look and be like, oh, to your point about, I'm not sure I'm comfortable putting in windows you'll see that that's what's happening at that house. So you can choose not, or you might pick another location. Oh, but I am okay <laughs> with painting or spackling, you know, whatever. So you can kind of see what those, those opportunities are. When we have larger events, those opportunities are there. For example, we have our golf outing on Monday. And we have volunteers that are helping with registration. We have volunteers that are handing out bags. You know, again, it takes so it takes a village, right? It takes so many folks and hands and creativity and effort to uh, get done everything, which ends up being right that family, that house, that equity, that community, and that hope. Yeah. Did you speak briefly about the transport? That's one thing that struck me when I was looking at your website. And all the different aspects of, um, you know, all the different aspects of your mission and how you collaborate with other groups, even if people physically are not able to do some of the volunteering, that you look for faith support from people. So if you could just speak to that a little bit. Yes, yes. So, um, all of yeah, yeah, as I say, we welcome all, all, all faiths, all denominations, and really in that space of that prayer support for us is um, having that ripple effect that happens, not necessarily in person, but viscerally, if you will, and spiritually, if you will, um, that allows us to keep doing what we're doing. So oftentimes that is, you know, funding, uh, legislation ease, right? I would love some <laughs> some getting through our government planning board meetings, right? With some good 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 vibes in that and the prayers that. So, yeah, um, we just we welcome that. We uh, we request that, um, and any any prayers, any thoughts that you can send our way, we we'll certainly want and support and appreciate and know that, you know, we know and understand that it has a larger effect on the community. So, thoughts, questions? Anyone want to share an experience? I know there's a few in here who have done some volunteering. Maybe you'd be willing to share some experience you've had. Where did the picture go? I lost the picture. We talked about 2004. I'm not going to call you that, Justin, but you said 2017. Women's <laughs> <laughs> Build has been a time when some of our sisters have gotten volunteers uh, from colleges and brought them to the site mm -hmm. during those women's <laughs> days. So, as I said, there is a history that we have with the organization, which makes us want to continue the relationship. 
Well, we so much appreciate it. And thank you for sharing the history and the support this community gives. Um, we were talking as well as Martin Luther King Day's Day of Service, and for us, that is our largest volunteer day of the year. Um, and again, any any from serving, we have a lunch and prayers, and at the end of the day, but then there's volunteering that's happening in the morning on the site. So there's there's something for everyone to contribute and to give. Yeah. I can. We volunteered several times over the last probably ten years. Sisters have gone, I said, the sisters are really good at the end of the build because they're great at washing windows and cleaning up and, you know, um, but we've been on site right at the very beginning too with some framing and and I can attest to the fact that the, the, the people who are there who are skilled are very good about teaching. And it's kind of fun to learn a new skill too, you know. We've done oh. painting too. Right, painting. right. Painting, yeah. And it just made me think of something. So we were talking about the dedication when we invite the neighbors and we invite the family and the clergy and everyone comes to that house and then everybody leaves. And then we do need cleanup crews. <laughs> <laughs> so the last dedication we did at 162 North Miller was in December. And you think about oh, sleet, so rain, hard. mud, uh, that place was trashed you know and so um, we do put those events up as well where we have crews that come in and just just mop floors honestly and kind of just get it ready so that when the family really walks through that door with their mortgage and their papers in their hands it looks beautiful and it's welcome i don't have a hammer nails at one woman's bill <laughs> some years ago yeah. i just learned recently how to pull up like uh the flooring like where it's like a shovel and I'm sweating. I was like, this is amazing. You know, <laughs> I said, if this is like therapy, you know, if you have any aggression here, just get, get on the floor and you'll do it. So <laughs> it's a good experience. Um, can you talk about how Habitat obtains the homes? So if that's something that we don't sort of typically talk about in this service. Because we are purchasing these homes or Oh, okay. I wasn't sure where you're where you're leading with that, Heidi. Thank you. As I mentioned, um, you know, we've had the relationship with the city of Newburgh in which we purchased the homes for a dollar or paid the back taxes. But now that the real estate market is not conducive for them to do so, right? So they were able to do it because they would foreclose on properties that were sitting abandoned with the influx of people from the city, they came in and would almost like cut the city off at the pass for that foreclosure, right? And be like, walk up and offer cash for property. So they never kind of make it to the foreclosure, um, which is good. We don't really want people foreclosed on, but that dries up our supply, <laughs> our supply chain, if you will. So now, yes, now we are um, purchasing uh, property and homes and or still receiving donations for homes. So if people have estates that they're, um, you know, families who maybe can't, um, we were saying about when you built this campus, right? That's really expensive to rehab places. Uh, so oftentimes families are faced with that, and so then they'll donate the property to us. We do, as a nonprofit, have access to some grants and some subsidies that allow us to do a little bit more of that rehabbing. And we partner with the Land Bank of Newburgh as well for some federal funding. So uh, month six, still learning all the <laughs> dotted lines of how that works. But um, is that what you're ready? Thanks. You mentioned before about um, expanding outside of Newburgh per se. How does that work? Um, you know, in terms of different localities, um, does someone go out and kind of assess homes that look like they need rehab or? Yeah, so I've been on, I was calling it like the chill tour of Orange County since I started because as I inherited this position and inherited their strategic plan to, to build, expand our building area, I really wanted to first get a feel for the municipality buy-in. We have to make sure that any community that we go in that the municipality really sees our vision and our mission. Um, for multiple reasons, right? We want to make sure that they can rally support for us. We want to make sure that as we go through the proper um, processes to acquire property, building permits, code, et cetera, et cetera, that we have that municipality support in there. Secondly, the other thing that I've been evaluating is the community in which 
um, the support comes out for. We know that we have such a strong base of volunteers and donors in Newburgh that I cannot expect those folks to just pick up and then go say to Middletown or to Port Jervis or to Monroe, right? So the other evaluation that we're doing in those areas is to see what community connections are out there and that volunteer base, because essentially we're kind of rebuilding that in a micro, micro version of what we do in Newburgh. The other component we look at is property taxes. And I've become an expert at that as well. Understanding when we build property values, how it works, how uh, tax assessments are done to, um, to correlate back to the fiscal part about us being viable in order to build and, and to pay for that as well. And then the fourth thing is proximity to where we are and where our resources are. Um, so as much as, I'm from Port Jervis area, by the way, as much as I would love for us to pick up and move and, and build there, that's not really going to be an immediate availability to us because our warehouse is in 125 Washington Street. And so they you know gas and bringing things up and down in that space. And so there's a lot of conversation about that. We actually have a committee um, within the agency that is called the Regional Site Committee, and that's their job is to support me in making some of those decisions and kind of uh, filing for that. We have got strong um, commitment and strong vision from our local municipalities, I will say that. Uh, I think people know and see the need for it, especially when you, when you break it down to that, this is your town clerk that can't afford a $380,000 mortgage. You know, we, Constantly on all the symposiums I'm going to in Orange County, they're saying people are leaving. You know, our children have no place to live. They're leaving. They're out of here. And with Governor Hochul's, you know, housing um, platform, and I won't get terribly political, but I keep saying we need affordable home ownership opportunities, not just affordable rentals. We need to build communities that process all of it. You can't go from renting a two-bedroom studio, mm -hmm. you know, apartment and affording a $380,000 four bedroom house. We need things in the middle, right? Which historically we know, and I remember from my parents, they had multiple homes and they would build the equity and then be able to sell it and move on and build, you know, and build without those opportunities in the middle, our children won't have those opportunities, so. I'm so grateful. Thank you for having us. Um, definitely love with all the letters to our legislators. It's certainly um, helping our bottom line, helping us continue the work that we do. And uh, we, um, I did not put a sign up sheet at each table, right? Um, but I know it might be helpful if anyone would like to get your newsletter, be on your mailing list. It really is helpful. I am on the mailing list. I'm on, you know, fake friends on Facebook and absolutely love to see. If you want to see the work of Habitat, be friends on Facebook. Yes. Because you will see inside, outside, you see the family. It just is, you feel connected with them on a daily basis. So forgive me for not doing that, but some tables do have a piece of paper. Please, if you could get your name and your, your address, your, e uh, your email address, your name and your email address, and um, this paper has some of them, okay? And then we can give the, that to you. We are so grateful. And Mayor Catherine is our president, and she will say the thank yous. First, I want to thank um, Sister Norma and Sister Virginia for being persistent in getting this organized. <laughs> This was a conversation that we had back in February mm -hmm. and you have gotten us involved and we are really grateful. I was privileged and I use the word privileged to be at the blessing with Sister Virginia and Sister Norma and Sister Eliana mm -hmm. and of the interfaith build and the blessing the Protestant minister brought all his children from the church and they blew bubbles and they were breathing life into the house. And the Jewish representative brought a mezuzah that typically goes right at the entrance to the house to bless it. And Virginia had a beautiful prayer that spoke to who we are as presentation people. 
and so on. And we were blessed that we were able to sign. I was so excited to sign a piece of wood yeah. um, because we got to sign the wood. So we put on that piece of wood, love one another, which is from our foundress, Nano Nagel. And then we all signed it. And it's just so heartwarming to know that that's going to be part of somebody's home, you know. But Jill and Heidi, we are so grateful to you for your time, for your ministry, and for providing what, what we're a part of as well in the Newburgh area. So please accept this on our behalf, okay? And we look forward to collaborating with you. Thank you. little bit if there's other questions that maybe you're too shy to ask for these things. so thank and, you and that's a picture of the home that we've been talking about this house blessing that occurred in april uh it was for this this three this will be three families that were in this home this is on third street if you're in newburgh and you want to see it the the paintings in the on the panels were from um, our mlk day that engaged the youth so typically we do not allow 18 and younger on our job sites, but we do do projects here. And I will tell you that when we were putting these up, two doors down, the neighbors came out and they were clapping. <laughs> they were clapping because these homes have been sitting there and there was a fire in one last winter. You know, they, they just, they are a concern of safety in neighborhoods and they were just, they're just amazed that they're happy we're there. We haven't begun building there yet, but at least they know our presence is there. They know that we're coming. We do, we do neighborhood cleanups. We make sure that, you know, that community is a part of this entire process from, from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of coffee and uh, little things for lunchtime. Stay as long as you like.